everyone, Luke Groman, FFTT. Hope everybody is well and had a great weekend. Uh, the weather here in lovely Cleveland, Ohio, was absolutely beautiful, particularly for a uh, getting late March, getting to be late March. I uh, was outside a bit today, so got a little vitamin D on the uh, on the old head here. So hope everybody's well. We're going to jump right into it here. A few questions here. First one is from Max. Uh, touch on Basel three changes to gold holdings scheduled for June. COMEX the last couple months, gold and miner action, uh, post-Fed, even as the rates rise, etc. Uh, the, so the, the, there's a Basel III net stable funding ratio, uh, NSFR for short, uh, is apparently, it's, it's part of Basel III, it's apparently was scheduled to go live June 28th, 2021, globally. Uh, it's apparently going live in the U.S. July 1st. Um, from what I've seen, it's been delayed in the U.K. to January of 2022. Um my reading of the of the regulations, and take that with a grain of salt because I'm not a lawyer or a banker with that or a regulator, but my uh, my reading of it is it seems to read as if it is desirous of forcing an unwind of the massively uh, levered, unallocated paper gold markets uh, because basically it it makes it very expensive for bullion banks to hold unallocated gold positions and very cheap to hold allocated physical gold position. So uh, we'll see if it, what happens with it. Uh, I'm always reticent to say this is it for the gold market because I've been around the gold market now for 12 going on 13 years and I've been through a number of this is it's before. And so uh, it's just, uh, uh, I, I wanna be um, uh, conservative with that outlook. Uh, nearer term, I think, you know, I would say two things. Number one, the action in gold prices where we have seen prices go down even with real yields falling uh, a little bit. And when we saw uh, strong, even even with strong global physical gold demand, that over the last several months, I think in, on some level was indicative of uh, or, or something you would expect to see if, if, if bullion banks were trying to get on sides ahead of, uh, of an, an NSFR change. Um, I don't want to ascribe motive, causation, correlation is not causation, but that's interesting. More near term and tactically, what I think might be more interesting and relevant for us is if we look at what has happened to the price of gold and the price of gold miners over the last one to two weeks, even as U.S. nominal 10-year yields have risen pretty significantly, the, the price of gold and gold miners have stopped going down and have actually held in pretty well on a relative and on an absolute basis which is a change versus the prior couple of months. So we'll see if there's some legs to it, but it would seem to suggest that maybe the gold market is starting to sniff out uh, the possibility of yield curve control uh, from the Fed in coming months or quarters. Uh, the next question from Mike G. Russell Napier recently stated that the Fed can use banks to control the money supply through banks curbing lending. Is this a workable way to control inflation without the need to raise interest rates to do so. It sounds rather MMT-ish. Would this obviate the need for overt uh, yield curve control? In my opinion, this makes sense uh, in terms of just the mechanics of it. Uh, my issue with it is that if we look at the Fed's latest H.8 report, which looks at U.S. bank sector aggregate data, what we find is this. So we find total bank loans uh, total bank assets, total bank loans grew 0.9% in 2018, but bank loans to the U.S. government, bank treasury holdings and bank agency holdings, grew 3.5%, so about 4x the rate of growth uh, of overall loans. In 2019, we find total bank assets grew 4.1%, while bank loans to the U.S. government grew 14.2%. Again, uh, three plus uh, percent, uh, about uh, three, three times premium, three times faster growth rate loans to the U.S. government. In 2020, we find total U.S. bank or total U.S. bank sector assets grew 15.1 percent, while bank loans to the U.S. government grew 22.3 percent. Again, big premium in loans to the government. And finally, in January 21. At an annual rate for that month, total U.S. bank loans rose 3.3%, while bank loans to the U.S. government rose a cool 31.3%. And so here's my point in all this. And I agree with the mechanics of what the always brilliant Russell Napier says. He's, he's absolutely brilliant. Um, and and uh, when I've been exposed to his work, I, I love his thought process. 
with that said, if we if we look at the reality of what's happening here in the U.S., the U.S. government is over 20 percent of GDP and bank loans to that sector of GDP, that 20 percent of GDP are growing at a massive premium to total bank loans. And there's likely no political will or political ability if we watch what happened throughout a lot of cities in the United States last summer uh, to cut those loans. So we could shift in theory, the, the, the Fed could shift um, the, the bank loans to the U.S. government and, and the Fed could make those loans themselves effectively by upsizing QE. Uh, but ultimately, uh, in the end, it points to a U.S. economy where the Fed is losing its ability to control the money supply unless it is willing uh, to, to effectively choke off loans to the private sector to offset the growth in loans to the U.S. government sector. But in theory, they could do that. But if they do that, that just seeds more control of total U.S. money supply to the U.S. government even faster than it's already happening. So, uh, and, and we know, or we, we, we think we know, I think it's highly likely that the U.S. government is likely going to just keep spending more and more money given the obligations they have, given the, the great power competition with China where defense spending look like it looks like it's going to ramp up, et cetera. So, uh, that to me, I think is is the issue with that. Where with basically, and Russell Napier, I believe, has said something to this extent. Where basically, you're starting to see this fiscal dominance, where the government is basically gaining control of money supplies. What I just delineated is exactly that: is the government is gaining control of money supplies, and there are very few governments in history that have managed money supply particularly well over time. Uh, and then the last question from WMR. Have you looked at the differences today in the size of other debt markets as compared to the last time yield curve control was started? Size of the mortgage market, corporate debt market, personal debt, etc. If so, what would you expect to happen to debt markets other than treasuries? Uh, I think it's a great question. And to me, I think it's why yield curve control, explicit yield curve control in particular, scares the Fed to death. Um, I've not looked at, in detail at the relative sizes of, of the debt markets. Uh, the last time the, the U.S. did explicit yield curve control, but we do know that was 1942 to 1951. And so we do know the U.S. debt markets were, are, are in orders of magnitude uh, bigger now than they were then. And critically, the euro dollar market, as far as I know, did not exist from 1942 to 51. And so this is why I think it scares the Fed to death, explicit yield curve control, because uh, yield curve control in treasuries, okay, they, they cap those yields uh, by growing their balance sheet, great. But all other debt markets are going to then look at that and go, oh, inflation might be coming, currency debasement might be coming, I need to sell debt. You, you see the mortgage markets sell off. So mortgage spreads over treasuries would likely rise. Corporate spreads over treasuries, junk spreads. And uh, the Fed would likely be uh, forced into eventually uh, yield curve control in those markets as well. And then the, the finally, the euro dollar market, where you'd have these overseas dollar loans uh, where the Fed is setting policy, but which over which they have very little direct control, uh, you'd expect to see euro dollar market, uh, de debt market loans also uh, rise uh, in terms of the spreads. So yields rise. And then the question becomes, if that creates crises elsewhere, uh, ultimately, uh, you know, that could cre create a stronger dollar short term. But ultimately, as we saw last year, it's all the Fed's problem when push comes to shove. So uh, to me, it all boils down to when you say, OK, when you ask the question of how big are the debt markets now versus where they were the last time the, the U.S. did explicit yield curve control, they're way bigger. And the conclusion is this. Uh, you could see the Fed's balance sheet rise non-linearly in a very compressed period of time. If this process is is managed poorly or if it just sort of gets away from them, and that and, and it, it might happen even if it's managed well and it doesn't get away from them. So uh, to me, uh, it, it continues to suggest uh, you know, the allocations we've long discussed, gold, Bitcoin, gold miners, industrial equities, uh, 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 tech equities, uh, things like that. Okay, last question. I, 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 we're going to do one more here from Jerry. Uh, your opinion on the status of the Turkish currency, what it means for the people of Turkey. In terms of uh, the currency going forward, price action, I have no opinion. Uh, what we're seeing happen tonight in FX markets to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, the Turkish lira uh, makes sense. It is selling off sharply, given what Erdogan did, which was to apparently 
uh, fire the central banker that was what was raising rates to defend the currency. And I think it is a, an important lesson here. Uh, the problem of a central banker raising rates to defend the currency, um, but the actions of that slowing down the economy and creating domestic political problems for the domestic political class uh, is a timeless problem and it's rearing its head again. And critically, Turkey is not the only nation facing this problem. There are many sovereigns in the same boat. Uh, in terms of the outcomes for the Turkish people, it's likely to drive higher inflation, potentially much higher inflation. And so that's probably, uh, uh, unfortunately, not a great outcome for the Turkish people. So uh, I would also say, let's see if it drives any contagion elsewhere. Um, uh, you know, it is a it is a a big move in a currency market. And these are all these currency markets are all quite uh, interrelated over time. I don't know how big. Uh, the, the, the Turkish uh, uh, the, the, the lira market is relative to others. So we'll see. We should start to see that uh, go, but it's just something always to pay attention. So with that, I'm going to finish up for the night. I hope everybody has a great week. As always, if you're interested in learning more about what we're up to, check us out at fftt-llc.com. And if you like these updates, check us out. Check out our Tree Rings product. Uh, 10 most interesting things every week. Quick synopsis getting great feedback on it. So thanks again, everybody, for joining me. I hope you have a great week. Stay safe out there. We'll talk with you soon. Take care, everybody.